you find yourself wanting more people in your congregation to feel ownership of your church? Or do you want to be able to be freed up more throughout your week to help people make spiritual meaning of their everyday life or to be out in the community connecting with your neighbors? If so, you are in the right place today because in this episode, we will dive into how our primary model of leadership in the church has actually caused exhaustion and burnout amongst church leaders today and what some practical next steps are that you can take to find a more sustainable and communal way forward for you and your faith community. You're in for a treat today as we dive into a case study of a church in Northeast Minneapolis. Hello, everyone. I'm Alicia Granholm. And I'm Dwight Shiley. Welcome to the Pivot Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. A lot of pastors we talk to long to see increased ownership or engagement in the life of the church by the congregation and know that leading a church by themselves is unsustainable, not to mention unbiblical. But many church leaders don't know where to start to make this shift. So in today's episode, we want to offer a case study of a congregation that has experienced, experimented creatively with, their, with empowering people to love their neighbors in the name of Jesus. And along the way, they've reimagined the role of pastors and staff in some life-giving ways. We are super excited to have Pastor Stephanie Williams O'Brien with us today. Steph is the lead pastor of Mill City Church in Northeast Minneapolis and the author of Stay Curious, How Questions and Doubts Can Save Your Faith, as well as Make a Move, How to Stop Wavering and making deci- and Make Decisions in a Disorienting World. She also teaches at Bethel Seminary and is the co-host of Lead Stories Podcast with Joe Saxton. Steph, welcome to the Pivot Podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. We are so happy to have you here. Let's dive in. Steph, can you tell us a bit more about Mill City Church? Yeah. Well, um, the short version is uh, some of us thought, hey, what would it look like for a group of people to go to a specific part of the city and ask the question, what is God doing here? And how might we join in what God's already doing? And if we were going to do that as a group, that sounds like a church. And so we gathered some people, uh, myself and my colleague, Michael Binder, from Bethel Seminary, from some churches that were very much around the heart of multiplying church. Um, So people who were ready to send and we moved to that part of the city, specific part of Minneapolis and started to do the process of discernment. What is God doing here and how do we get to join in? How can we respond to that? And then doing the work of leading other people to learn how to ask those questions and to join in. And then soon enough, there was people joining us that weren't just from Northeast, but cared about that part of the city. And uh, we started to gather in homes and then started to gather with a, a Sunday worship expression Um, But continued that sense of what does it look like to ask those questions in our everyday spaces. And that's now coming up on 16 years in about six months. So we're in in the middle of that, which is wild. (laughs) So it feels like a lifetime ago. But still the same core DNA is driving a church that looks very different than 30 people in a a living room. But um, it's been a pretty wild adventure. So give us a little more of a snapshot of um, um, Mill City now. Meets, has a building, is that right? Mm-hmm, yep. You were in a school for many years. Yeah, give you a little of the timeline of how we got yeah, from there to here. Yeah, tell about that evolution. How do we get from a living room to a humongous historic church building <laughs> all within the same square mile of each other? <laughs> so yeah, so we, you know, I think when we were asking the question, what God's doing, what is God doing in this neighborhood? You know, it was clear, like the best thing we could do is to to participate with what was already happening outside of even just church. So we connected with a lot of local churches, which was awesome, and figured out what the heartbeat was for them. And then realized pretty quickly, you know, these school buildings are empty on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And so why don't we occupy one of those spaces when they're already empty to provide some rent towards the school district? And there was lots of challenges to doing that, but uh, grew into a beautiful relationship with a public school um, that we quickly figured out was one of the highly struggling schools. Um, Figured out how that was a way in which we could ask that question. Well, what's God doing here? Mm -hmm. And how can we join into that story? And a number of really neat things happened in that relationship with that school and then with a lot of other community partners. I think our heartbeat right away was, why start something new if we can just join in what people are already doing, which builds a lot of credibility in the Mm -hmm. neighborhood, too, because Mm -hmm. people are always looking for more support for what they're doing and what they're doing well and what they need more resource for. And so kind of really kind of found ourselves as a church that was becoming very known for loving this neighborhood in the name of Jesus, loving our community in the name of Jesus as our mission. Um, And using our time on Sunday at the school to equip people for and and give them a missional imagination for what that might look like for them personally, how we might be able to do that in groups um, and how as a church we could stay committed to this part of the city, no matter where our congregation members were coming from. And um, that resulted in worshiping in that school for 
the better part of 14 years, um, and I say the better part because we did get kicked out a couple times um, because public schools needed to keep their priorities and replacing the fire alarms one summer was one of their priorities, for instance. And so and we ended up at another school. And um, then when COVID happened, we were all the schools were shut down from renters and students, obviously. And so we were without a space then. Um, in the meantime, we had bought a small building that we used kind of as a midweek space, which became a really great kind of hub for everything happening outside of Sunday, especially our equipping and training. And so we were able to set up a studio in there for COVID and everyone's got their COVID story. Um, ours also included renting a wedding re wedding hall for a while because the school would not let us back in, even when it was safe to meet in a, in a large wedding hall. Perfect, actually. We could spread out real good and everything. Um, and they weren't doing a lot of weddings then either. So that was cheaper than it would have normally been in Northeast Minneapolis, which is pretty expensive. Um, and then, you know, we were so thrilled to get back into the school because it, it felt like home and it's been such a meaningful place for us. And we went back and... Uh, the the very short version of a story is that one of those church partners that we were committed to from the beginning to say, hey, there's only one church of Jesus. It just meets in different places. And there's there's reasons that they're different. Um, one of those churches approached us and said, hey, we're looking at such significant decline after COVID. Um, and we see that mm. seems that you're having the opposite experience. And so we started a conversation and entered into the exact same question. What is God doing here? Mm. And how might we as these two congregations join in? And that resulted in um, that church closing. And us, we use the term adopting them uh, spiritually and physically and emotionally and uh, took on their people first and foremost, uh, who anybody who wanted to become a member of our church could immediately become a member. And um, we inherited then their 55,000 square foot building in the heart of Northeast Minneapolis that had zero debt and no giant maintenance to, in their in their credit. And um, also uh, some lovely people who had loved that part of the city for a really long time. And just about not even a year ago now, as we're talking here, the early 2024, we moved into that building together. They came over to the school with us for a while. And then we had been starting while we were adopting this 135 year old Swedish immigrant or originated church. We were also helping start a Hispanic, uh, Latino, Spanish speaking church. Um, so I don't necessarily recommend adopting two very different communities at the same time. But um, that Spanish speaking church had been meeting after us and we were really like shoving it in the time frames at the school the school believe it or not turns into a spanish immersion school while this is happening i'm not kidding you they change the name to a spanish name and that happens right as we're like well we'll just leave all this portable church stuff for you and your growing congregation and all i told that spanish-speaking pastors in return was that when there's no job for me anymore, that they would hire me someday <laughs> in the future, because I'm pretty sure they are a big part of the future. And so there we go. And now we're six blocks apart, the school and our Spanish speaking church, and then uh, all of us together at the at the church building. And um, I guess the final thing I'll say about Northeast is it's very, um, it's the historic, most historic part of Northeast Minneapolis. We named the church Mill City. It's the original vocation of the city, uh, the, the flour mills and the sawmills. And so, um, there's nothing you could say to Northeast Minneapolis to say that you love them more than to adopt like a legacy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how could you possibly say, we love you. We mean it. We're staying here. Young punks that are only been here for 15 years. 15 years is nothing to them, you know, but then to adopt a 135 year old legacy that's been there forever from, you know, Swedish immigrants that are now of all different colors and places um, was a pretty remarkable thing that literally would have never been anyone's strategic plan. But when we ask the question, what's God doing here and how we respond, mm -hmm. that's how we ended up there. So mm -hmm. now we're we're uh, one church and they were a smaller group compared to our group. So um, the big question was, can the culture that we have of mm -hmm. very much kind of moving forward and stepping into what God's doing in the future and not holding on to the past, um, but respecting the past, could our culture be able to, um, you know, uh, move forward with enough momentum to pull the declining culture and so far, so so good, I think, in that way. And um, most of the people stayed and are pretty thrilled to see their church building fill, filled again. But I think even more thrilled to be asking questions that they had not been asking for a long time about what God might be mm -hmm. doing instead mm -hmm. of how are we going to keep this thing open? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm super curious. Steph. I have two questions and thinking about and they're a little different, but maybe maybe they're related, actually. Um, one is I'm really curious. Uh, you just mentioned it about the culture mm -hmm. and how how you've gone about kind of merging these two communities mm -hmm. and um, and maintaining the missional DNA of Mill City. Yeah. And then 
maybe separately, but maybe not. I'm curious about even just your how you lead this new community yeah. and what that looks like for Mill City. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and talk to your question about the core question today of just collaborative leadership and people seeing themselves as a part of what's happening here, not just the people that need to fall in line with whatever the leader's vision is. I think that that was what the missional DNA was, right? It was not that myself or any of us who are on staff know the future of this church. God knows, and God's going to reveal it through all of you. And so that's that's very different than some of my friends who I respect who spend, you know, a week in the mountains and there are churches expecting them to come back with the vision for the year and they're excited to hear what the Lord has spoken to this person. And that's just not how we've ever led and that's not how I lead and I don't think I could if I tried to be honest, but when you tell people like the future that God has for us is within you. And so we need you to participate mm-hmm. in order to discover this together. Um, they sit up straight. They like mm-hmm. lean in differently, you know, mm-hmm. like they're like, wait, mm-hmm. what do you mean? And, um, you know, if people are hoping for the the leader to come down from the mountaintop, they're not going to stick around Mill City very long. But if they're thinking, I want to participate and I want to be able to 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 be in the in the right in the thick of what God's doing, then they're really drawn to it. And so that was a really strong culture. Still a question of like, could this be something that overcomes the decline culture that had come from a, any church that's been in decline as much as as long mm-hmm. as that church had? Mm-hmm. Um, but for us, that that looks like how we lead in our staff team, how we lead with our covenant members or the people who have really we 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 think of covenant membership as the folks who are saying I am most committed to our mission, meaning they're going to they're going to be the the. People with the, I say, the highest antenna of listening to what God's asking. Mm. And and they're saying, I commit to that. I commit to listening for that. Everyone's welcome to do that. But those folks have said, we want to do that. We're, we're supporting that. It's not merely, we're going to keep this thing running, which was how the other church had been. I think, you know, I've thought a lot about this and, you know, people can have a different kind of take on this. But it brings up the question of that people often use talking about the priesthood of all believers. Mm-hmm. And I just think we've really missed the mark on that. And I don't know that if I could necessarily nail it perfectly, but it's not to run the local church. Like being a priest is not (laughs) to run a local church. And if you look at like what a priest did, you know, and I wasn't alive 2000 years ago or 2000 years before that, but it's to be the people that connect other people to God. Mm -hmm. And so the priests are supposed to be doing that all the time. And if all of a sudden, you know, how I, that must have just been mind blowing to the mm-hmm. first century church that everyone gets to be a priest and then that it wasn't going to be in this temple. It was going to be mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. Then we've really got a confusing culture when you go back to which was happening in this declining church. The priesthood of all believers means you all better keep this thing running. And whatever pastor we happen to have, we hope will you know, let us do what we want so that we can keep our local church the way we want it to be. Mm -hmm. This is not any one person's fault or even their fault as a community. I think that's what we have in some ways, in some communities, said the priesthood of all believers is. Like, Mm -hmm. you're supposed to all be running this church. And I look at it as the people running this local church called Mill City Church are the staff who are equipping the people to be the church then in the neighborhood, in the local space. Does it mean that we want people to participate in the everyday things of greeting people. and Yeah, sure. But their their preoccupation should be with what God's doing, not do we need to change the colors of this wall, (laughs) like, you know, and like (laughs) and keeping them focused on that. And that's Mm -hmm. where that culture of decline pulls people inward and towards Mm -hmm. pink colors and, you know, what priorities we have on, you know, how soft the pews are and all those things. And and coffee and the you I'm sure the joke you guys have had on this podcast before is who moved the coffee differently and whatever. <laughs> but when you give people the the call that it's your job here to figure out how this local church and you as the church are going to participate with God, you do not have time to talk about the coffee, y'all. If you've got a problem with it, let that person know and we'll work on it. But you're not going to be the person who's going to decide this because you've got bigger things to decide. People, they they orient differently. So mm-hmm. You know, it's been a work in progress with bringing on that church. Um, It was very important that they understood that their church was closing, Mm. that this wasn't really a merge, that this in in no way was this a merge. Their church was closing. Their assets, their ministries and their people were being given over to another church. There's not a third entity that was created. That would have been that would have been a big problem if we hadn't articulated that as clearly Mm. because the churches in our context, both churches were congregational poly, so they needed to vote. And both churches voted over 90 percent. Yes. Which I think is a miracle today that any group of Christians voted 90 percent for anything. 
<laughs> much less two groups, but they had to feel the weight of this. This was yeah. their decision. And they had to discern what was best for like the kingdom vision of Northeast Minneapolis. Would it be better that we did, we moved into that, that space together. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, say more about um, how you equip people to mm-hmm. ask those God questions yeah. about their daily life mm-hmm. um, and within the life of the church. And concretely, how, how does that actually take hold? What's the equipping look like for that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think of it as this has got to be pervasive in every space that we're in. So I think of it as a uh, culture that sometimes we have programs or vehicles to help people move through. So the culture that we want to create is one that's asking these questions and expecting that if we pay attention, God's going to give us, uh, you know, glimpses of what that is and we're going to move towards that. And so that has to be everywhere from how I talk to my staff to how they talk to their teams of lay leaders in their areas to how we talk absolutely in sermons. I mean, that's that hopefully that's a given. But there's very few times that a sermon won't include questions that people are needing to go and ask of the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. um, versus more behavior modification. It's not that we don't want to encourage people to, you know, step into holiness. But like at the end of the day, what's God's invitation to you in that? Mm -hmm. And really talking about that. But then it does get into the practical of, you know, if people are really ready to lean in further, what does that look like? So one thing would be with our covenant members. Everybody's experience listening to this of church membership meetings is wide. And so we literally at the beginning of almost every meeting explain to people why we do the meetings the way we do, because they come from such different backgrounds or they're many of our community. Are, we're not coming from a church background or they were coming from a, a, a different religious background. So we're saying, hey, the purpose of these meetings is, yes, to do some business because you are the people who have the most ownership of this church. We vote on some things. But number one purpose is to give to you the things that we see, the questions that we have, and then to receive from you what you think God's saying and hearing, and then to send you off to to listen to that and to give that. And the leadership's role is not to tell you what the vision is, but to give, to make meaning of everything you heard and to help you then step into that vision. So it's, it is still a visionary role, equipping even in that space is to say, hey, we're listening to you. How do we make meaning from what we hear from you and then give it back to you as sometimes I use the term tracks to run on and ways to live out what I heard. Here's what I heard from you. Mm -hmm. Here's where we're going to go forward. So it looks like, you know, our membership now in a membership meeting is 200 and something people. But you know what? Even with that many people, you can do it. You put people at tables. You get some pens. You have a time of listening. You do a dwelling in the word. You ask very specific questions. You prompt them ahead of time to be thinking about this before they come. You say before this time and next time come back with this question and uh, sometimes we'll get post-it notes and everybody gets to write. And and then we take that and we do like qualitative and quantitative results on that feedback. And then we can give back to them like, this is what you all said. Mm. And it has determined so many things of how we move mm. forward, what we hear from these people in those types of spaces. We can also do it through um, other m- mediums of listening with smaller groups or sur- even surveys and things. But um, it's very empowering to people to be asked, what do you think? So for instance, We've got a meeting coming up and the the plan is to do some business, do the voting we need to do on some stuff, and then just to pose to these people, why do you think in this last couple of years, given everything going on in the church, Big C or the global church, this specific church went through this really unique experience, is growing even though so many are declining and is stepping into it? Not why, like, what are we doing right? Why would God do that? And mm-hmm. what do you think God's telling us about that and what we're supposed to do about that? That's a very different question than would it be more strategic for us to have another service or start another site or plant a church or just go with the flow, right? Those are good Mm -hmm. questions, I guess. But the real question is, why would God be doing what God's doing right now in this experience and how do we respond to that? And when you put that in front of people instead of just the budget, (laughs) like it's a totally different meeting. But then it gets down Mm -hmm. to the practical, like to your question too, in addition is when there's people who were really leaning in and saying, I really want more of this training. Um, we, we do a lot of equipping, um, whether it's, uh, short time courses that are a few weeks, whether it's a one-time seminar, um, for instance, we've got an innovation seminar coming up that just says, Hey, if you're thinking about starting something, we've got some people in here who are experts at doing that. And they will start talking with you about that. And maybe you want some ongoing coaching with them, that kind of thing. Um, or we have year long experiences of cohorts where we just say, Hey, if you're wanting to go deep in the way of Jesus, 
to do that, you've got to commit to like a weekly time. We will get you some childcare, but you got to show up (laughs) and we're going to do this and we're going to really talk about it. And then you're going to have to actually put this into practice between now and the next time you come back. And then we're going to talk about this again. And you're going to have the same conversation partners throughout. And by the time this is over, we're not sure what you're going to do with that. But the expectation is that if the word discipleship's in there, that there's going to be some sort of multiplication of what God's done in you may have something to do with our church local or not, but it is the work of Mill City Church for you to take what you've learned to apply it in your everyday spaces. And so, I mean, the the refrain that I always say is, our mission is to love our community in the name of Jesus. And that community is Northeast Minneapolis. It's this church community, but it's every community that you're in, in your everyday spaces where you live and work and learn and play. You better figure out what God's doing there and join in because it is not for the faint of heart following Jesus in 2024. So those are some examples of the practical way that we encourage and equip people. And um, it's not for everyone. And so we don't we don't suggest that. I, I'll give other people a list of other churches that would have a different experience if they if that's where they're at, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll give them a list of churches they shouldn't go to, too. But mostly, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, I really believe that. Like when I say there's one church, there is only one. But if people aren't in the right local one, the number one role of the church is to help you follow Jesus. And if if Mill City is not the best fit for somebody, how can I help them get there? Because we're not going to be a this isn't what I just described is not what everybody wants to do in the mm-hmm. season of their life. Mm-hmm. And I think just not having being ashamed of that and just saying this is what we're trying to do here. People appreciate that clarity, too, in this day and age, I think, as well. <laughs> people appreciate any kind people, of clarity, right? People appreciate clarity. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, Steph, mm-hmm. I'm really curious. When Mill City was planted, um, I know that there was an element of missional communities mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that there's been kind of a transition um, yeah. since then. And I'm curious if you could um, maybe not just share about missional communities, but even more so just kind of the process of transitioning and yeah. and what that discernment looks like. Because, um, you know, whenever we're really excited about a ministry, I think for any of us, it can be um challenging to <clears throat> remain discerning about its life um, and how it evolves if we don't start it that way. You yeah. know, so yeah. if when we're starting that we kind of are constantly like giving it to the Lord and really mm-hmm. seeking, you know, God's engagement and leading, um, we can, you know, we can get stuck and it can be really hard to to iterate when we need to, to ch- change and adapt things. So I'm curious if you can share about yeah. kind of your experience. Um, yeah. How, that, that, how yeah. that's gone. Well, I think, you know, if you're truly asking the questions that I'm talking about and you're not just saying, what do we think would be the most strategic move here? Um, I mean, it just lends to different outcomes and to things that you would have expected and then oftentimes things you would not have expected. And so I think for us, you know, the early the early days were, OK, we know that our focus is how do we help people connect? And we just use the simple like up in and out language, connect with God in, mm-hmm. connect with each other, out connect at join these relationships join in loving the people in the world god loves okay so if that's what we're doing then what are the vehicles for that and um everything i just described are those vehicles but what we quickly realized is that the small group movement that was very popular especially in evangelicalism in the in the u.s um distinctly different from some of the other places small groups were in the world were very much in sometimes up but mostly in Mm -hmm. and successful only when they were homogeneous. So in large part, when Mm -hmm. people were most similar. Mm -hmm. And since our church was saying, well, we're not looking to be homogeneous, first of all. And if you're if you're spending the very little time you have as a human these days in a group that we facilitate and it's only connecting you with other people and it's only going to work if you're all similar. That pretty quickly was like what we were not going to do. (laughs) So then Mm -hmm. the question became Mm -hmm. because I don't I don't feel called as a person who is was stepping into to ministry to facilitate homogeneous friendship groups. I mean, that's just not what I felt called to do. You know, in the fivefold gifting in Ephesians 4, I'm more prophetic and apostolic. And even that in our collaborative leadership, helping people know what those giftings are and how they how that plays out in leading our local church, but also being the church wherever they are. And so I thought, you know, we want places for shepherding, but Mm -hmm. if people are going to give us a little bit of time, how could that be different? And that's when the idea of missional community or Really, the best way to think of it is medium-sized groups of people that are going to do all three things together. They're going to be able to connect around their shared understanding of faith in Jesus through Bible study, worship, prayer, 
even just, you know, a shared sense of purpose and mission mm -hmm. of their why being Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then in saying we do need each other. This is really challenging to do on our own. Mm -hmm. And then out saying what is the, I, I would say like our mission to love our community in the name of Jesus. If you're taking a bite-sized chunk out of that, and you're going to chew that one together, just this little smaller group, what it, would that be? And so a lot of those emerged over the years um, with the more apostolic people, evangelistic People who have those gifts mm. um, and then the shepherds saying, well, someone's going to have to care for these people you're gathering and joining in. So it's really a great um, vehicle for different giftings to be used. And so um, a number of those popped up over the years. We realized that they probably have like a two to three year life cycle. Um, and that's the benefit of being part of a larger church, not just that community. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the micro church community will talk about that. They don't usually have that longer life because they're responding to what God's doing then. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, for us, there was a lot of benefits to that. People were also still wanting that other type of equipping that I'm talking about, large in part because they had their in, they knew who they were doing mission with, and they knew their their mission. Some people were like, it's my workplace, mm -hmm. or it's my neighborhood, mm -hmm. or it's this passion area that I have for racial justice or whatever it is. But they wanted to feel equipped for how I do that distinctly as a Jesus follower. And so we still have those folks today. Um, COVID really like took the steam out of those, la the missional communities that existed at that time, because a lot of theirs, they were very incarnational and you like couldn't <laughs> be Get together. Yeah, like there was yes. this incredible group of women who were yes. connecting with the Somali women in Northeast mm -hmm. Minneapolis, mm -hmm. uh, which is profound. And, you know, in, you know, crossing cultural barriers and religious barriers, you literally couldn't, they couldn't be together. And so then when you ask the question, well, what's God doing now? It wasn't try to become friends online with them. You know what I mean? It yeah. just. It, you have to follow the actual leadership of what the spirit was doing. And it wasn't it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. So um, since all the change our church has gone through, I just realized pretty quickly as we were coming out of COVID, um, one of the things that we did during COVID was connect people geographically. And so the people who already had the DNA of up in and out were like, well, that's what we're doing here now that we're connected in our people who live near each other, which was great for that time during COVID. Um, so in some ways, those function like somebody would call a missional community. But as we're coming into this time now and realizing we just take, took this whole other church and its culture back to that question, I think this, this year has been very much about how we help people embrace and engage the culture and DNA that we've always had. We're not, this is the new vision. Mm -hmm. I remember coming out on September when I think churches are supposed to have like a vision Sunday. And I was like, here's the vision, the same one. <laughs> we're doing the same thing, but it's a completely different church at the same time, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I think that there'll be some things like missional communities that emerge, but we're seeing people do this in with groups of people that they're that aren't connected to our church. I absolutely see that as this is you living this out, mm -hmm. you know, as Mill City Church. But just because you're the only Mill Citizen, quote unquote, that's there doesn't make it less, you know. Yeah. But it's not at this moment our what group life is at at Mill City, mm -hmm. which is the way it expressed itself for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, right now, it's way too important that the DNA is engaged with in the culture is is shifting through the, some of the things I just described. Um, but I believe like when you give people access to understanding their giftings, like the fivefold gifts, and you give them uh, the skills and the and the experience of listening and responding to God, they will start to step into whatever God's telling them. And so um, our job then is to help the tracks to run on, help organize some of that and give them resources. And so I'm excited to see, you know, this time next year, what comes of that. But yeah, it's like being willing to be I've read this book about being an agile church once, and I think that's it. Like, you just have to be ready to, you can't, you can't have a, a plan that you are going to absolutely live out for five years and still be agile. You just can't. So the name of the game for us is experimenting, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we experiment? The missional communities, each one of them was an experiment. Mm -hmm. The concept was an experiment. And we're not done experimenting. So I know that there'll be things that continue to emerge just like this crazy story of these last couple of years would have never been, never been on the radar. But when you bring up at a membership meeting or any other group of leaders, how should we experiment instead of what should we launch? You'll have a completely different conversation. And mm -hmm. I'd rather have the experiment one. That's the only reason I'm sitting here with you guys right now is because of the <laughs> results of those experiments, you know, and what's happened. And people need to experiment in their personal lives too. I don't know how to tell you how to reach your software company, yeah. but I can tell you how to, Start some experiments in there. Yep. <laughs> That's what I can do. <laughs> See what happens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Seth, this is so rich. Let me just reflect back a couple of things I'm hearing. One is um, the focus really is on everyday people within the church mm -hmm. 
really um, being present and loving their neighbors wherever they are, yeah. right? And I think it's so easy for churches to to really have that focus on, if I'm a leader, my primary mission is to get people engaged in this organization right. in its mm -hmm. activities mm -hmm. to sustain it, yeah. right? And and you've really, um, from the start, it sounds like, been released from that set of, that framework, that set of expectations. Um, so I'm curious to say, for you to say a little more about then what what do leaders do at Mill City? The staff, mm -hmm. like how does the role of a pastor, I mean, you've sh shared a lot about this in terms of helping people ask those questions or learn to experiment, but say more about kind of how you and the other staff spend your days. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think um, the truth is, is that when you do get people engaged around everything I'm talking about, you know, they do want to help support the the functions of the church. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it, you know, getting people to volunteer for things we have to make those asks too, but it's not pulling teeth. Like people are like, well, yeah, I want to help create like the space that's being created for me to ask these rich questions and to feel what I often say is equipped to follow Jesus in an increasingly complex world. I want this to keep existing for me and others. So I will mm -hmm. participate. Mm -hmm. but that's not why they're there. You know, mm -hmm. you're not mm -hmm. here to, you know, make sure there's coffee, but we do need some people to help with coffee because we all want coffee. That's great. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But like, you're coming in here because you have a, something you need to be able to go live out there and be who God's calling you to be in those spaces. Um, and so there's a value for it. And when people value something, like they want to participate in its thriving. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to ask the question, how do this does this thing survive? So then, you know, yes, coming back to the staff and like what that looks like. And our staff has grown quite a bit, but the the function of the staff primarily is as equippers. Um, some of those people equip by spending time with leaders who are going to be equippers that are lay people. Mm -hmm. Some of those people spend time with people who are being equipped to do what they feel is reasonable and to participate. And for them, that's to join in, you know, serving a, a, a neighborhood partner because they're not leaders and they're not ready to do that. They could be someday, but that's not where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, for other staff members, it really is making sure we have our administrative ducks in a row because we don't want the priesthood of all believers worrying about that. That's leadership they should be purchasing. Mm. They should be investing in this leadership mm. to take care of that stuff so that they're not, it's not their burden if the boiler worked right this week. It's something that they've hired some people to handle because their work as the church is stepping up to be present in the, in the space and to, and to create, help, help facilitate spaces that create missional imagination and encouragement and support like Sunday morning. and to be the church in these other spaces. Mm -hmm. And so some of the staff realize that part of their role is to take that stuff off of the people's plate. And for others, though, you know, back to like a building now that we have to deal with that kind of thing. Like it's a huge asset to the neighborhood and to the community. Mm -hmm. And there are some people that being able to work with their hands and to help c cut costs. Mm -hmm. So is there a building team that gets to work on that? Totally. But it's the people who get excited about that and feel like that's the way they're going to serve, mm -hmm. not making sure the coffee's hot. Mm -hmm. So there's a role for that. But that's not the primary occupation or, or like thing that occupies the minds of the people. And so for the staff, it does take a constant redirection, though, because the default is to do for not to equip people to do. And so sometimes it just means like one of my staff members the other day said, these folks had this great idea and they wanted to do it. And then as soon as they realized we weren't going to do it for them, they were like, oh, I don't know about that. And so we canceled it. You know, it's but that's you. You're training people <laughs> into to understand your role, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so we don't get that right all the time. But um, for us, you know, even now that we have a church building, uh, even my full time staff, I expect them to be there on Sunday and about two half days a week. Otherwise, the expectation is that they're spending time with people. They're out in our neighborhood. They're somewhere by themselves to get the work done quicker. Or we're engaging in in meeting with leaders and helping them feel coached like we're coaches. I think there's another role that's emerging more in my mind. And mm -hmm. you guys are familiar with this, which is curating resources. Mm -hmm. So a big part of our job is to in the vast, you know, dump that is the Internet to pull <laughs> to pull resources that we curate that we say, hey, look, if you're looking to. Of course, I care about biblical literacy. You're not going to get that from me by listening to me a couple times a month whenever you show up. So if you really care about this, let me say these are the resources that I support. And that that is a part of our role, too. Mm -hmm. Equipping them to understand God's story so they can live into it in a richer way. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to happen because they made sure to not miss any of my sermons. It's going to happen if they're asking those questions and we have we're ready to respond and equip them, whether it's a class 
or a digital resource or whatever it is. So yeah, it depends on the staff person, but that's the the constant filter is, is this equipping people to live mm-hmm. on mission or is this causing people to think we're doing this for them so they don't have to do the mission themselves? So to me, it really is about deciphering the difference between the work of the church and the work of running the church organization. I actually want less people to be too burdened by running the organization so they can feel most empowered to be the church together on Sundays, on Wednesdays, whenever we're together and everywhere they go by trying to decipher that. It's a little bit of a, um, you know, threading the needle, but I think it's an important one. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. Um, <clears throat> Steph, I'm really curious. Um, as you as you all kind of thought about um, these two congregations coming together mm-hmm. and um, particularly around the culture piece. Yeah. Um, I'm curious kind of what some, uh, cause I know that you think a lot about leadership. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we share that passion. Um, and so, you know, um, leadership wise, like what were some thoughts around the intentionality that was going to be necessary in order to, to um, really move forward with a shared culture? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it it really does. I mean, at the end of the day, as a lead pastor, it really does matter what I say and what I don't say and how that goes and where I am and how my presence and all that stuff. And then me recognizing that when I choose not to be somewhere, who is there and how do they, you know, giving giving the the sense that if we are a collaborative leadership, when is it important that it's me? When is it important that's other people? And Mm -hmm. I don't know that we did that perfectly, but there was a lot of thought to that. Mm -hmm. Even as I was the one that started to enter into the space of the congregation that was going to close and provide leadership and voice to to those spaces, that's when it began. When I said, hey, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. So if you're deciding this, this is what you're signing up for. Mm -hmm. You're not signing up for uh, a similar version to what you're and we're not even talking about worship styles. None of that. This is the culture that you're signing up for. And I remember at one point they called me into a kind of a town hall type thing, which we would never do anything like this now in our culture because that's just a great way for a couple people to say a lot of stuff. So I was called into one of those meetings to help respond to some questions. And I just realized part of their culture of decline had led to a lack of clarity about what was going on and what was happening and who actually got to make what call and who didn't and what. And so I just was like, I got to be honest with these people about what's happening here because it's not fair. Clarity is kindness, like mm-hmm. Bene Brown says. Mm-hmm. They, it's not fair for them to think that they were going into a situation where there was going to be some sort of combo pack of church in the future. Um, It wasn't going to be that. So I just started really early articulating to the best I could, explaining it to their leaders who were going to then explain it to the lay people. Whenever I had a chance, they had me come preach once and the whole thing was just like, well, turns out you people have been asking for 135 years what God's doing and how you respond. And that's why this church has been here this long. So Mm -hmm. it's your turn. Mm -hmm. And just put, putting that to them. So they, there's plenty of things I'm sure felt disorienting once we were together, but mm-hmm. I don't think like the deep culture and DNA of missional leadership, thinking about who God is in that way and following the spirit and being Jesus centered would have been surprising. Uh, that was all throughout the discernment process and then had to be intentional as we went. One in- interesting thing that we were really strategic about was I was never in any of the spaces that we created for the grief. So we created a lot of spaces for that mm. with people who are trained to come alongside folks who are going through loss. Mm. I would talk about those spaces. I would advocate for those spaces. But when they saw me, I was talking about the future. When we were talking about the past that they needed to process, mm-hmm. there was other people holding those spaces for them. Mm. And I would say, it's very normal if you feel that. I would over overly give people validation for that. Mm. But I would not lead those spaces. Mm. I would only lead the spaces that were about how we were going to join in what God's doing next. And um, using the past as an example of how we're going to move forward, but not overly celebrating the past and those kinds of things. Um, but we did do a lot of intentional things with their legacy. I know this isn't a new thought for you guys, but to say, well, I don't know, what were those entrepreneurial Swedish people thinking? Mm-hmm. Turns out this church was started by six women who thought, I don't really want to go across the Mississippi River with my horse in the snow to get to a Swedish speaking church. So if we could start a small business, we could raise enough money and then we can start a church here. So that's a cool story. Let's talk about those ladies. Let's talk about how mind blowing it would be that now this church, you know, in 2023 was adopting this community. And now there's, you know, two African pastors. What? Like that would have blown their mind. And people, you know, there's something about just seeing like this is I know that this has been a last 20 years of decline. 
but this is not who you are mm -hmm. or were mm -hmm. or who you're going to be if we decide to do this. This is where it's going. But I was very honest with them. And one of those town halls, somebody used the word merge and we said, well, this is, an, this is not a merge. I said, unless you're thinking of, and I named like 694, the pretty big like <laughs> highway that we have nearby our church. I said, and then like Silver Lake Road, kind of a small like little road. I said, like if you're on Silver Lake Road and you're deciding <laughs> if you're going to merge onto the highway, <laughs> that's going to just keep going. That's what we're going to do. And a few people like cracked a smile. And then a few people I saw like a silent tear go down their face. And I thought, this is this is it. This is what I need them to hear. I do not want to bait and switch people or surprise mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And I think they'd be really excited to be on the highway once they got on it. <laughs> and so <laughs> if it's if it's a highway towards what God's doing, like, I think they're going to love it. Yeah. And so I'd sometimes joke with people behind the scenes like their leaders. I'd be like, they're going to love it. They just don't know, <laughs> you know. And they do love it. They do love it. So, um, I mean, I could talk for a long time about the intricacies of the culture shift, but it's remaining just so committed to it and mm -hmm. saying that this is the most important thing. You know, like people always say, like culture, eating the strategy for breakfast and all that stuff. Like it, it has to all flow from the culture. It can't be the other way around. Mm -hmm. I can't just take their programs and infuse culture into it. It had to be this is coming into our culture and moving forward. And it meant all their programs stopped. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't a, it wasn't a blend. It was you're joining into this. And now the new things that are emerging are coming from our culture and the, and the shared culture, mm -hmm. like an adoption of a family. If a new little child joins a family, they take that family's name. It, they're not a new family. The family has adopted them. They're going to change that. But going forward, it's they're, they It's distinct what family they joined. Mm -hmm. And the family lets is shaped by that new human in the family. But it's not the family changes its name now and is a totally new family. It's a changed family moving forward together. And that's just the way we had to keep, keep it on, keep, keep on focus with that. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So one last quick question for you, um, <clears throat> for any of our listeners or watchers who are maybe in a church that isn't used to being so agile mm. and ha have the kind of culture of experimentation that you've described, um, what would be your counsel to leaders in terms of a, maybe a first step or a next step that they might take? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Don't hijack the membership meeting. Like, don't do that. Start with a few people <laughs> who are, you know, we we know the um, innovation curve. Um, you know, honestly, maybe leave those really high innovators alone, but go for those early adapters and just say, hey, would you be a part of experimenting with me about some stuff? And don't start with experiments that would fundamentally change the church. Mm -hmm. Start with experiments like, hey, look, our church has been in this block for X amount of years. And the the amount of people that have lived here and the businesses, like, we don't even know what's going on here. Would you be a part of an experiment where we would just spend some time in these spaces and see if we notice God doing something there? And they might say, how do we know if God's doing something there? If you're willing to do this experiment, we'll talk about how to look for that. I don't totally know either, but we could figure it out together. And if we did this for six months, I bet we'd have like really different information about why God's put our church here in this day and this moment than we would right now as we sit in this little room uh, that used to be a church library and these books smell bad because they need to go. Like that's, I mean, that's the moment, you know, that's what we were in. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that all the whole world around that little library just changed. And where's the experiments to understand that? I think those types of experiments will grow because it's intriguing and, and, and it's the early adapters that reach the mid adapters that meets the late adapters. So if someone's listening to this and they're like, I want to lead like that, it's like, well, well, again, don't bait and switch people. Mm -hmm. Clarify like, hey, we're going to move in a direction of asking these questions and and bring that up. In a way that, I mean, honestly, that church that we adopted had started to ask questions in a better mm -hmm. way or this wouldn't have worked for them either. Mm -hmm. And about a year and a half earlier, they started to say, let's just stop saying what should we do and just say what it's God, like what it's God going to actually ask us instead of, you know, the kind of moving to the how might we instead of how, what, what what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how are we going to get out of this versus <laughs> yes. how might we move forward? And I just say, yeah, take a group of people that are excited that you like to be around. And like people you actually like and say, hey, this isn't even a program. This is just something I want to try because I want to know more about what's going on. Mm. That would be a good experiment. Or um, another experiment could be what if we just figured out what the, you know, what our youngest members that are actually, you know, able to articulate what they're thinking about 16 year olds, 18 year olds, 22 year olds. We got like five of them. What if we just did an experiment where we tried to find out what they think God's doing mm -hmm. and why they're even at this church? And they might be like, well, my parents brought me here. Okay. What do your friends care about? Like, what if we just wanted to find out, not because we're going to, they're going to go bring all their friends here. They're not going to. What is going on? What's God doing in those young people? Mm -hmm. And how might those people feel if you ask them? I mean, so yeah. the experiments could be different. 
But I'd say start with one and and move from this, the church question of how might we survive to how might we notice what God's doing in blank. And I think those people will love it. Worst case scenario, it's a fun experiment, and that's the only one. Best case scenario, it's the beginning of a series of experiments that could change the whole culture of the church. Yeah. Mm. Steph, thank you so much for this wisdom and the energy. It sounds like you're having fun. Oh, yeah, it's a blast. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like anybody else. The best and the worst thing about ministry is the people, but yes. I'm one of those people, so <laughs> it's it's great. And I've had a lot of fun. It's really hard sometimes, but it's worth getting up for every day. Well, thank you all for joining us on today's episode of the Pivot Podcast. We hope that you found it inspiring and encouraging, and we'd love to have you join us again next week. Dwight Shiley and Alicia Granholm signing off. 